Today's uh, topic is on sports and pumping, finding the right mix. Uh, my name is Rick Philbin. I'm VP of Sales for Asante Solution, a maker of the Snap Insulin Pump. Um, I've had type, di type 1 diabetes for 17 years, been on a pump for a little over 16. Um, I started in sports medicine in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, within about a year and a half, got involved with a group um, called the Diabetes Exercise and Sports Association and worked with them for about 12 years. It's now uh, known as insulin dependence. Um, I work with children with diabetes, talking with the families, um, did their sports program, program for over 10 years. Um, we also uh, work with the parents, uh, talking to them about sports day management, uh, just diabetes and exercise in general. And so today I want to talk about sports and pumps, but not just about sports. If you're active, um, you go to the gym, you're playing with your friends, um, you're walking with your spouse, that's exercise and that can affect your, your blood glucose and we'll talk about techniques to deal with your pump in order to have a successful um, exercise program. And oftentimes I hear that I'm not an athlete so I'm not going to get anything out of this and we're all athletes, it's just whether or not you are in training or not. There's a famous quote from uh, a cardiologist Dr. Sheehan was just, he presented exercise um, as prescription for his patients um, and I truly believe that that exercise can help in your diabetes and certainly um, uh, with the pump it becomes much easier. So what are the goals of exercise management? Obviously you want to get a decent uh, blood glucose level so you perform at your best but I often um, put the performance first. What do I want to do? Um, I'm a very avid basketball player um, I'm interested in how long, how hard, how well I play. Diabetes comes in second. I want to put performance first. I know that I have to do things specific to uh, my diabetes in order to perform well, but I always want to put the exercise performance first. Um, there are two things that you probably need to be concerned with, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. If you had a choice to be really low or really high, it's probably better to be really high. Hypoglycemia and exercise can be a, a mer an emergency where you know you may be staring up at paramedics. So if you want to err on anything, you err with a high blood sugar, not a low blood sugar, and we'll talk about that. Um, it's important when you start any exercise program to get a medical evaluation. Um, depending on how long you've had diabetes, uh, whether you have any complications, it may um, determine the type of exercise or the intensity of the exercise. But don't think that because you have diabetes or because you, you have a complication that you can't exercise. Can't stop and don't. I throw those out around diabetes. Important to modify and make sure that you're not putting yourself at risk. But it should always be, what can I do in order to meet my goals around exercise? Um, the standards that you, the American Diabetes Association recommends, they're talking about 150 uh, minutes per week. And if you're younger and you're involved in a sports program, you easily hit that. Adults, sometimes it's a little tougher. You can mix that up. You can do 30 minutes a day, five times a week. You'll get that. That's fine. Um, I often hear people say, I do the same thing every day, uh, and they're fine with that. If your goal is just to get that exercise in, maybe it's stress management, fine. But if you do the same thing with the same intensity every day, you're probably going to plateau fairly quickly. So it's important to mix it up, maybe some hard days, easy days, aerobic exercise versus weight training. Um, and the guidelines when you go to the gym and you see what your heart rate should be, oftentimes you see 60% to 85% of your maximal heart rate. Uh, with diabetes, you probably want to be just a tad more conservative, so maybe you start at 50% and go to 70. Um, but again, not much difference between the two. Um, it's important to make sure if you're, for instance, you're doing weight training, you don't want to do weight training back-to-back -back days. It's important for recovery. Now, if you're going to go upper body one day and lower body the next, I can live with that, but it's important um, that you give recovery time. And obviously, blood uh, glucose levels plays into a lot of this. So what are the factors that affect blood glucose? And the circle that you see here um, obviously, insulin, uh, for people with type 1 diabetes, taking insulin, whether it's with shots or on a pump, um, how much insulin you have and when you introduce uh, exercise or competition into this can wreak havoc on your blood sugar. 
The last thing you want to do is have to stop or not perform well because your blood sugar is too low or too high. Um, going around the, the circle here, you see alcohol. Why would we be talking about alcohol and exercise? Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, if uh, someone get, goes and does a 5K and they go over to the tent and there's beer there, if you exercise, do not eat and have alcohol, you're asking for trouble. The alcohol is obviously in your system. The liver is trying to break down the alcohol and now it can't you know, release any glucose. So if you have exercise, which can be insulin-like, now have alcohol on top of that, you're asking for, for, for trouble. So make sure the take-home message is if you're going to exercise, make sure you eat before you have that first drink um, after exercise. The time, the type, the amount of exercise all play into what happens with your blood glucose. If you exercise in the morning, it's probably going to affect your glucose a certain way compared maybe to the afternoon. If you're sick, make sure that you give your body time to recover. I know it's a difficult time, whether it's a head cold or flu. Again, you're not going to perform well, and then you're going to struggle with your blood sugars too. So make sure you give yourself enough time to recover from any kind of sickness. Um, the type of food, there are three types. The carbohydrates, the fats, the protein. The most important, by far, of those three around exercise is carbohydrates. And everyone thinks, oh no, carbohydrates raise my blood sugar, i got to cut down on my carbohydrates. That's simply not true around exercise. You need carbs to fuel the body to exercise. Now, I'm very uh, in, in tune with the types of carbs that you have. If it's a high glycemic food, um, you know, any of the pastries, things like that, something will shoot your blood sugar up around exercise, probably not good. But that combination of carbs, proteins, and fats, and they're having that right ratio um, you know, oftentimes I hear people talk about 50% of the diet in carbs. I think around an exercise, certainly competitive exercise, you probably need to be higher than that. I could live with 60, even maybe up to 70%. But look into this. Oftentimes the strength athletes, people that go into the gym, football players, they think protein is the, the food that they should be consuming the most of. And it does not give you the fuel. Certainly, uh, people that exercise and the strength athletes need more protein than the average person, but we get that in our diet. We don't need to have all these supplements that, that you see on TV. Um, and the best time to have protein is after exercise, not before. So I, I talk with people that are taking uh, protein drinks and then going and working out, and that's, they're actually getting it backwards. So we'll talk a little bit about the food. And then lastly, stress. People that are involved in competitive sports there's a stress level involved. The physical part of the exercise stresses the body, but also the mental side. So before a race, if you're all worked up about the race, you know, or the competition that you're going to, to, to face, that can affect your blood sugars. Depending on the level of insulin in your body, that can, you can start with a really high blood sugar. You know, hopefully as you get started, it gets into a, a normal level. But all these things affect your blood glucose. And it is an individualized disease. Because what happens on Saturday doesn't mean it's not going to be different on Sunday. So a lot of it is trial and error. So the type of exercise uh, can affect your blood sugar. So there are two types, aerobic, meaning with oxygen, and anaerobic, without oxygen. So you say, well, anaerobic, what type of sport would you do in anaerobic? Weightlifting, sprinting, any kind of burst. Uh, a football player, offensive, defensive lineman, every you know minute, they're bursting for about three or four seconds, and then they stop. That can have uh, an increase in, in blood glucose, depending, again, on the levels of, of insulin in your body. So those type of activities, you may have to um, uh, offset it with your pump. Maybe if, if you find yourself going high during the, the competition, you may even want to set a basal rate a little bit higher to offset some of those peaks you get. What you have to be very careful with, especially using insulin, that afterwards, even though that you might spike during the competition, there's a good chance you're going to drop hours afterwards. Now, you get into some of the other uh, types of exercise, and the purely of an uh, aerobic exercise would be like a marathon. So that is over time, and probably most people, if they're uh, on a pump and using a certain regimen and don't change and they get involved in an aerobic exercise, they're probably going to go low. There are sort of certain uh, techniques to decrease the chances of low blood sugars around aerobic exercise. 
So when you're a little confused about why my blood sugar is going up or down, think about the type of exercise. Is it aerobic? Is it anaerobic? And some of the things that, uh, that you can do to offset, the, offset that. So the, the absorption rate, um, most people know that when you give insulin, and um, if it's too much, you're going to go low. If it's not enough, you're going to go high. But exercise could actually increase the rate um, of the insulin absorption, so you need to be careful with that. And we'll talk about the timing of the insulin as well, but just know that exercise, and I'm talking mostly aerobic exercise, so running, swimming, biking, that can be insulin-like. And, and here's the point that, um, that I think everybody should know about insulin, whether you're young or old. When does it start working in your body? When does it peak? And then when is it out of your body? So for people on pumps, they're using rapid-acting uh, insulin. They're, the analogs are Humalog, Novolog, and Epidra. Um, depending on what you read, it may be a little different on the, the, um, the onset and the duration and the, the um, or excuse me, the onset, the peak, and then the duration. But generally, they start working in your body in about 10 to 15 minutes. So if you give yourself a bolus of insulin, Figure in about 10 to 15 minutes, it's going to start working. It's going to peak in your system probably around an hour to two hours. And then it's going to be outside your body around four hours. Real important around exercise to know that. The key is to try not to exercise during the peaking of the insulin. All right. And for people that are not on pumps and they're using Lantus or Levermeer, um, it can work. I just think it's easier on a pump because one, you're dealing with one insulin, and two, you can turn down your pump in order to avoid, uh, avoid that peak. So someone that has their pump and they want to do a temporary basal, um, the, the guidelines, and this is in uh, John Walsh's pumping insulin book, uh, Howard Wolpert and Smart Pumping, they talk about cutting the basal rate by 50%, which is a smart move. And again, the only way, gonna, only way you're going to know if it works, if you do that, and then check your blood sugar around that and say, you know, did I go too high, did I go too low, or did I stay within a, a decent exercise range? But the, the idea is when you set a temporary basal, going by this little chart I'm talking about, the, the onset and that peaking, you're going to have to start that temporary basal maybe an hour or two prior to the exercise because that's when it's going to be peaking. So you want to make sure at the start of the exercise you have less insulin, if that's the goal or the technique that you're using, um, so that you don't have to stop because of a low blood sugar. And then the question is, do you keep that temporary basal afterwards? And there are different techniques, and a lot of people do keep a temporary basal. And again, 50% is, is an ideal, uh, at least to start and see how it works out. And then you say, well, how many hours? Often, people get low blood sugars in that four to six hour range after exercise. Uh, some people even the next day, up to 24, there's one study that talked about 48 hours after exercise, potential to have lows. So what I like to do is say in the exercise that I'm doing, how hard, how long, and then determine how long I should set my temporary basal. So a lot of times I'll set it for about six hours, so I cover that you know, four to six hour period. But if I really you know, worked harder than I normally do, I may put it up to eight or even nine hours of a 50% reduction on my pump based on this information on the, the peaking uh, of the insulin. So who's at risk for hypoglycemia? Um, weekend warriors. So, you know, the, the guys that work all day, all week long, and, and they don't find time to go to the gym, and now they want to go and play two hours of basketball on the weekend, they're more at risk for hypoglycemia. The, the kids that don't do anything in the summertime and now all of a sudden school comes and they're involved in cross country and now their, their intensity kicks up, their chance of hypoglycemia increase just because their body's not used to it. The good thing is as they become more fit or specific to the exercise, now they're probably not going to have as many lows or as severe. Uh, what's nice about it is that the cells that hold the glucose, it's called glycogen, the stored form, they become more efficient as you become uh, more fit to that particular exercise. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes I hear doctors say, geez, you're going low all the time, let's hold out the exercise and get your diabetes in order, and then we'll introduce exercise again. And to me, that's backwards. You definitely have to do some things, but exercise should be a part of your life, and you certainly don't want to sit out because of lows or even highs. Um, any type of new activity, 
you say, you know what, I'm going to the gym, I'm on the treadmill, doing that, you know, three, four times a week, and now all of a sudden you go and uh, you're going to be on the uh, stationary bike. That's different than a treadmill, um, and blood sugars can change on that. So just know that new activities can cause um, blood sugars to uh, wreak havoc, and, and you adjust with that. Um, people that use tight control, and everybody knows that our goal is to keep it as close to normal as possible, um, the downside is that there's an uh, increased risk of hypoglycemia just by keeping tight control. I know with my diabetes, the best number I could be at is 100. If I could keep that 24-7, that's my number. But I need to be a little higher than that when I go play basketball. So 150 is actually a goal, and I can even stretch it to about 175 prior to playing basketball. If I'm 200 or 225 and I play, when I'm done, I may be 300. So I, I give myself a little bit of insurance, but too much, again, it gets out of, uh, um, out of balance with that. If I go into the weight room, I can be at 110. So the difference between the two exercises, the basketball, because I play for a long, longer time, it's mostly aerobic, even though they're spreading up and down the court. Um, so over time, my blood sugar is probably going to come down. Now I go into the weight room, it's anaerobic. Those are the quick bursts that the blood sugar may go up. So that's why I can keep it down closer to you know, my goal of 124.7. I can 110, 120, and when I'm done, it may be uh, spiking a bit, um, but I, I don't have to get up to that 150, 175 based on the type of exercise. And we talked about the alcohol use uh, and, and avoiding exercising, not eating, and then, then uh, drinking alcohol is not a good, uh, good way to approach it. And what can you do with your pump? And this, whether there's kids going off to college or uh, anyone is done with their exercise and wants to have a couple beers, you can reduce your pump, similar to exercise. We talk about a 50% reduction. You can do that based on the alcohol. Um, for beer drinkers, Michelob Ultra has 2.6 grams of carbs. So you don't even have to introduce insulin uh, if you have a mixed drink where there's you know, sugar involved that you, know, you may have to deal with some insulin and then you know, you also make bad decisions. You have a couple of drinks and, you know, you're going to bed and you're not sure about how much insulin because your blood sugar is high because of some of the sugary drinks. So I recommend, obviously, drink in moderation, but look for drinks that don't have a lot of uh, sugar, a lot of carbohydrates in it, and then reduce your pump. And you can even extend that overnight because we're all concerned about uh, low blood sugars in the middle of the night. So you can do things with your pump to offset some of that. So the day after, whether you're, again, you're an athlete or you're out cutting the lawn, um, what you do on Saturday can affect how your blood sugars uh, react on, on Sunday. And a perfect example uh, I'll give is like a soccer player. So they're playing multiple events. So like 10 in the morning on, on uh, Saturday, they have a game, and their blood sugar's in a decent range. And maybe they go low a little bit, but they have Gatorade. Uh, they are able to keep on the field and no major problems, and they have a game in the afternoon also. Maybe they have a, a low that they take care of, but again, it's not a major problem. They're done, they're tired, they're not really hungry, they don't eat, and the next day, all of a sudden it's the semifinals, 10 o'clock, they're in there, they get a low blood sugar, and they're like, wow, this is lower than it was yesterday. Um, and they drink their Gatorade, and 10 minutes later they go low again. They're like, wow, this is uh, unusual. Well, it may be what you did not do on Saturday, which was replace glycogen stores. Basically, eat food to replace the stores that you lost during exercise. The ideal time to replace glycogen stores after within 15 minutes. The cells are most sensitive at that time. The type of food, um, as I mentioned earlier about the protein is important after exercise, and I agree, but still carbohydrates are the, the main type of fuel. And the recommendations are four grams of carbs for every one gram of protein. An ideal food after exercise, chocolate milk. It, one, it's 90% water, so there's a hydration effect, which is very positive around exercise. And it has that ratio, four grams of carbs to one, one uh, gram of protein. And uh, the study was done with soccer players. They, weren't, they didn't have diabetes, but they compared it to the sports drinks, the Power, Powerades, Gatorades. And basically they said chocolate milk is as good as the sports drinks, but maybe better, and partly because of the um, restoring the glycogen stores and having that right ratio of carbs to, to protein. And of course, checking your blood sugar is paramount through all of this. If you're not checking and exercise is involved, 
you know, you could drop and not even know that you're dropping till it's too late. So make sure that when you're exercising, even during the competition, if there's a timeout, halftime, check, see what you need to do. If you're wearing your pump and you're getting insulin, maybe you need to suspend it, or actually a better way to do it is just go to the temporary basal, put it at 0%. And if you want to keep it off for a half hour, an hour, so it automatically comes back on. But there are a lot of things that you can do to, to help uh, decrease the chances of stopping or, or not performing well. So there, there's actually three ways that you can um, help with exercise. Um, one is if you need to be a little higher, eat carbs. All right? The other thing is you can decrease insulin. Or the third thing you can do, and this is what I do, and a lot of people that are very in tune to their exercise, do both. So I believe that you need food, you need carbohydrates to perform, but you don't want to eat too much. So that's where the dropping of the basal rate is one technique. If you're going to eat something prior to exercise, and maybe if it's within an hour, um, give half as much of the bolus for that food as you normally do. Because remember, the exercise can be insulin-like, and once you start, the insulin is going to work faster maybe than the food that you that you're, uh, have eaten uh, within that hour. So don't put as much insulin in your body. And again, a good guideline is to cut it in half. And again, monitoring is going to be the way that you determine whether it's going to work or not. So what, what can you do to uh, decrease the chances? So we talked about the temporary basal, we talked about the food. Um, should you disconnect around exercise? And the answer is yes and no. You've got to find out what's best for you. I've disconnected early on. I now keep it connected all the time. And the reason I keep it connected is because, for instance, I'm in a basketball game. And the guidelines are you probably should not be off your pump for more than an hour. Some people can stretch that a little bit longer, but the goal is that right around an hour, if you're off your pump, you should probably check your blood sugar, and if, if you're going up a little bit, hook back up and maybe give some insulin. That's a technique. I rarely have my watch set and say, hold on, guys, we, I have to go check my blood sugar, and if it's a little low, I'm going to eat some carbs and then wait 15 minutes, and then I, we can start again. They just look at me and laugh. So I, I have to um, prevent that problem from happening. So I said, you know what? I'm now going to keep my pump on and I will not have insulin during the exercise. So let's say if I'm going to exercise for an hour, I go to my temporary basal, 0% for one hour, it automatically comes back on. I don't have to remember to do it. Now, that said, it's not a bad idea if you take it off, but just know that, and it's very easy for you to, to take off and just put your pump on the sidelines, all right? And you come back on, and it's very easy to, to, to click it back on. But oftentimes I hear, depending on how long it's off, that people have increased uh, blood glucose levels after exercise. So for the time that you're off the pump, calculate the amount of insulin that you lost from your basal, and you can introduce that back in, but not all of it, maybe 50% as a guideline. As you do any of these techniques, you, you definitely need to talk with your healthcare team. Don't just wing it because everybody's different. You have to make sure that you have somebody that knows, you know, about diabetes, knows about your, um, your diabetes, and the healthcare team, uh, whether it's the doctor or the diabetes educator, can help you with those things. <clears throat> what is the best time to eat prior to exercise? Bigger meals, two to three hours just so you give yourself enough time to digest the food and, and uh, you, you'll perform better um, two to three hours prior. If you're going to eat something you know, within the one, just make it a smaller portion, and then it can even be liquid as you, if it's uh, something that's within 10 or 15 minutes. Obviously, we can use food for blood sugars, but I'm just talking about for performance right now. Ideal time, two to three hours for a bigger meal. Um, as you get Closer to the exercise, smaller portions, something that's easily digestible. And if it's really close to it, keep it liquid. Um, and then you can determine if that's a good uh, strategy for you. Um, oftentimes, depending on the length of the exercise, people will eat something during the exercise, which is great. Uh, some people use a 20-20 rule, 20 grams of carbs for every 20 minutes of exercise. And a lot of times, they don't have to use insulin with that. So, again, you have to find out the strategy that works best for you um, and 
read, read in some of the books. There's a great book um, on uh, sports nutrition by Nancy Clark. And there's a little bit in there about diabetes, but just in general about how you fuel the body. Uh, Lance Armstrong was just a, um, he was obsessed with replacing glycogen stores after exercise. Uh, doesn't matter if they have diabetes or not. What's the best way to fuel the body so that you can perform at your best? And, and so read about those things. Try some out. Talk with your healthcare team to make sure it's safe for your diabetes. And I think you'll do well. Um, another thing prior to exercise, it's always good to check your blood sugar. I mentioned about 150 being an ideal number for me when I play basketball. If I test five minutes before playing basketball, and I'm 65, that's not good. I'm, yeah, I can drink some you know, juice or whatever to bring my blood sugar up, but I'm playing in five minutes. You're not gonna perform five minutes uh, later the way you should with that uh, 65 blood sugar. So what I encourage people, especially if you're struggling with highs or lows during exercise, check your blood sugars two times prior to the exercise, an hour before and a half hour before. So the reason I want two numbers, because I want to see a trend. If an hour before I'm 150, that's great. That's my ideal number. A half hour, now I'm 75, too low. And so I said, okay, I know that I'm on my way down or down. I need to eat something, and I have a half hour to, to correct that. The same thing with the high blood sugar. If I'm at the hour mark, you know, 275, that's too high for me. I may need to bring it down. You have to be careful about putting too much insulin because remember, once the exercise starts, there's a good chance you're going to drop. Bring it back down. And the other thing you can do is correct on your pump. Um, rather than correcting back to that magic 100 number, correct back to 150. And you may even want to cut down on that a little bit just uh, so you'd rather err with less insulin than more insulin. But again, you're looking for a trend. If you're using a continuous glucose monitor, great. Don't go by the number on the monitor. Go by the trend, the arrows. Are the, are the arrows, what the two arrows going down means you're dropping very fast. One arrow, you know, sideways, it means, wow, that, you're, you're pretty steady. That's a good thing. So look at those arrows and then determine. And before you make any moves, whether it's insulin or food, check your blood sugars just to confirm that, uh, you know, the, the sensor is, is uh, in even keel with uh, your, your blood glucose monitor. So the, some of the things that cause hyperglycemia we talked about is the um, anaerobic exercise, so the weight training, the sprinting, those kind of things. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so afterwards, people want to know, should I put insulin on a high blood sugar afterwards? And again, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, I do. I don't normally put as much as I would if I just had a 300 blood sugar after eating, because I know that even though that it was high uh, right after the exercise, there's a good chance because of the exercise, I may drop. So I'll give some insulin. But before I even do that, I just drink more water. More water is going to help. One, it's going to help bring down the blood sugar. If you're dehydrated, that could be the cause uh, of the high blood sugar. So the water is going to help take that blood that's really thick now because you're dehydrated and wash it through your system. The other thing it's going to do is if you have ketones, it'll wash out ketones. So performance will increase, and I know we're talking about after exercise right now, but the same thing goes before. Um, people say that if, if um, when you are starting exercise, if you do not have a, a level of hydration, your performance will suffer. Most people know that. If you're thirsty, it's too late. You're already dehydrated. What I tell people, when you get up in the morning, and you find out what the color of your urine is. If it's a dark yellow, probably means you're dehydrated. Um, certainly, there's certain meds and even vegetables that may color your urine, but that's a good uh, guideline. If your urine looks like apple juice, there's a chance that you're dehydrated. If it looks like lemonade, a clearer color, that's the, a good sign. That's the hydration. So prior to exercise, uh, the guidelines are uh, two glasses, so 16 ounces, a couple hours before activity within an hour, half, uh, eight ounces, so one glass, every every uh, 15 to 20 minutes during the exercise, four to six ounces. So it goes two cups, one cup, a half, 
and I think that your performance will, will improve with that. If it's a hot day, you may need more. If you're younger, smaller size, you may have to reduce that just because of body volume. But, um, you know, the, the uh, introduction of water for performance, very good. It also helps with uh, diabetes management. <clears throat> um, should you, uh, you know, check for ketones on a high blood sugar? The answer is yes. Um, most of the people I've been around struggle to stop what they're doing and say, again, that scenario about playing basketball, guys, I'm really high. I got to go in the bathroom and check for ketones. Um, so the, obviously the best thing to do is prevent that. But if you exercise on a 300 blood sugar, there's a good chance that you're going to go higher because the balance of insulin in the body is not where it needs to be. And now you introduce more exercise. The stress can cause to go high. Ketones are toxic to the body. You don't want to get uh, in a situation where you go into DKA. So prevent it, and then obviously treat it um, before you get back to any exercise program. <clears throat> so the, the guidelines that the American Diabetes Association recommends, if you're 250 to 300, um, with ketones, you're supposed to delay exercise. Um, if you're in that range without ketones, it's okay to, to exercise. Um, if you're 300 or above, they recommend delaying exercise whether you have ketones or not. I've talked with some endocrinologists, uh, especially in the pediatric um, uh, end of it. They're okay with their kids exercising above 300, even if they have moderate ketones, because they see that the kids drop very quickly after that. I still would not recommend starting an exercise program that high. Uh, so again, it's, it's about prevention. Um, they, on the lower level, they recommend being above 100, 100 or above. Um, I know that I can drop, you know, 50, 60 points after, you know, 20, 30 minutes into an exercise program. So if I'm starting at 100, you know, dropping down all of a sudden, I'm 45, probably not a, a good strategy. That's why I like to get up a little higher. And then going back to the type of exercise, whether it's anaerobic or aerobic, with weight training, sprinting type of activities, not as important to be up 150, 175. But certainly playing basketball, soccer, running on the treadmill, you need to be uh, cognizant of that. So the, the pump um, is, and most of the people, athletes, uh, people I talk to that exercise a lot, use a pump. I get where a pump is not for everybody, um, but it's easier to control, to move insulin in and out based on the type of exercise, based on the type of food that you have. It certainly allows greater flexibility. Um, the question uh, about the connecting or, or disconnecting um, Again, it's, it's an individualized, just like the disease. If you want to disconnect, that's okay. Um, for contact sports, uh, people say, well, geez, this is a, an expensive item. It's going to break. So what I do is I have a, a, a case that has a clip on it, and I just clip that on and slide it in here. And now it has a little more protection on it. For people that are playing contact sports, as an athletic trainer, we would have uh, people come in with like a, a bruise, like in their thighs, soccer players. And they wanted to play. Doctor cleared them, but we have to protect the bruise so it doesn't get hit again and cause uh, further damage. So what we did is we took a quarter-inch pad. We cut it out of the, of the pad a little bit bigger than the size of the bruise. And we put that on top. I took another pad without cutting it off uh, and where the hole is, but put it on top. So if it would get hit, the force would be around the outer edge of the bruise. And it works out fine. You keep it with the nice bandage or uh, it's compression shorts. So we started getting these pads, cutting out the outer edge of the pump, put that pad on, another on top, and now it protects it. So I, I use it... Um, uh, underneath my basketball shorts, I put the pad there, and I have compression shorts underneath, and I just pull it up, and it stays. Um, the pumps have good clips now, so I can clip that on my shorts, have my shirt hang out, and it hasn't been a problem for me. The other thing is all the pump companies will bend over backwards to get you a new pump if it breaks. They want to keep your business for the entire time you're on your pump, so they're, they will, you know, within 24 hours, ship you a new one if needed, and so make sure that you use... Um, you know, the resources at the, the pump company that you're working with. Um, you can use a temporary basal, as I mentioned before, around exercise, but another technique 
Um, most of the pumps have uh, up to four different basal programs. So you can have an exercise program. So if, if you don't want as much insulin around the time that you're going to exercise, and remember we said if you're going to use 50% reduction, you do that a couple hours before the exercise, you can set that in your pump. And that can be, you know, basal rate number two. So exercise days, you just click over to that uh, exercise basal rate and it does it for you. You don't have to go and do stuff with the temporary basal. So the, the pumps have a lot of features. Uh, make sure you use them. If you don't know how to use them, Go to your healthcare team, lean on your pump companies to teach you this because everybody buys the pumps because all these features, but when you talk to them a year later, most of them aren't using them. And there's a lot of great things you can use around exercise um, with your pump. <clears throat> so how do you prevent the delayed onset of hypoglycemia? Um, again, we talked about the pump and, and what you do. And let's first talk about what happens. So you eat food in order to give you energy to exercise. Um, there are the stored form of glucose in the body is called glycogen. It's stored in your muscles. It's stored in your liver. There's also glucose in your blood. If you're exercising and you deplete the stores in your muscles, in your liver, and you do not eat, so replace glycogen stores, it starts stealing glucose from the blood and it does it over time. That's partly why they call it a delayed onset. So as we mentioned earlier, it's very important to replace glycogen stores and ideally within 15 minutes of exercise. Now, if you have a high blood sugar after exercise and you think I have to eat something within 15 minutes, bring your blood sugar down and if it happens to be 30 or 45 based on that high blood sugar, that's okay. Get in a decent range and then eat something. And again, the ratio, four grams of carbs to one gram of protein, um, great, great uh, source of, of protein and carbs, chocolate milk, um, and you, you have to find out if it's working, stick with it. If it's not, look for trends before you make changes. Just because one time it's out of whack, don't go changing everything. That's why it's important to, to download your meters. If you're on CGM, see what's going on, and then you can make changes based on, on trends rather than one or two activities. So the temporary basal rates, <clears throat> again, the minimum of two hours, your adjustment minus 50%, um, starting before a couple hours. Um, of the pumps, uh, probably in the past seven to 10 years, probably the, I think a biggest advancement is called IOB, insulin on board. And basically it just says, when you give yourself a bolus, how long um, is that uh, bolus in your system? And in pumping insulin, they talked about the 30% rule. And this is where it all started. Um, and it's, this shows sort of a linear curve on this. But depending on uh, where, what you read and who you talk to, it's not as linear as this. And then we're talking about the rapid-acting insulin, so the Novolog, the Humalog, and the Epidra. So typically, if you take 10 units of insulin, within the first hour, about 30% of that is used up. Within the second hour, another 30%. The third hour, the third 30%, and the fourth hour, the final 10%. So it's a 30, 30, 30, 10. Um, and again, depending on the insulin, depending on what you read, you may get some different numbers, but it sort of started with this um, decay of, of insulin in the body. Great to know just with diabetes in general. Um, so if you eat breakfast and you check your blood sugar two hours afterwards and you're 300, the first thing you want to do is give yourself a correction. And before this insulin on board was in, uh, introduced in pumps, I gave myself a full correction. In fact, I used to check the lab glucose tablets because there was a chance I was going to go too far the other way. So now you put in 300 in your pump and it calculates when you gave that insulin two hours ago, there's still half of it working in your body. So you would not give yourself a full correction. You would actually give yourself half of that because you're at the two hour mile mark. So we said that the duration is four hours, and now I'm only two hours into it. The pump does the calculation for you. So it stops you from overcorrecting. Um, oftentimes, uh, and I heard one physician call it rage bolusing. You have a 300 blood sugar, and you give yourself you know, full correction. You check a half hour later, and it's still 275, and you give yourself more insulin. And what you're doing is just stacking the insulin, and you will go low, I promise you, if you're using that. 
So you got to give the insulin time to work. Trust your pump. Uh, work with your healthcare team on where to set it. So how does insulin on board work for uh, people that exercise? It's actually two ways. If you have a high blood sugar, that 300 again, and you want to go and play basketball and 150 is your number, correct back to 150, not back to whatever number you like to walk around with 24-7, but your pre-exercise level. Easy calculation to do. The other way, and uh, I talked to, um, to people that say, okay, I'm going to exercise at noon on Saturday. And they get up and they're going to have breakfast at 7 in the morning. So that's five hours prior to the exercise. And they said, should you give a full bolus for the food that you eat? The answer is yeah, because at five hours, probably all that insulin is going to be out of your body. So you do that. You give six units of insulin. You eat your breakfast. You get a call. We're going to play at 9 o'clock, now not noon. And here it is, you know, 10 minutes of 8, and you're going to go and exercise within an hour. And if you just go exercise and do nothing else, you increase your chances of going low. Sometimes people say, well, I'll put a temporary basil. Well, that's going to help a couple hours down the road, but not when you're going to start the exercise. So you need to eat something. And you say, well, how, what, how much do I eat? And this is where you can go to your pump, go to the IOB. Of the six units you gave yourself at 7 in the morning, how much is still working? Well, it's only 8 o'clock. So of the six units, maybe 5.2 units that's still active in your body. So maybe I'll have 20, 25 grams of carbs. If you're going to exercise at 10 rather than 12 or 1030, and now you go back and say, okay, of the six units, there's a 1.9 units still working. So you say, well, okay, I, I still need to give it a little bit. Maybe it's only 5 or 10 grams of carbs. So it's a great way of decreasing the chances of having a low blood sugar and paying attention to your IOB, the insulin on board. And the IOB only, is only about the bolus, not about the basal. Uh, but it's a great way to, to improve uh, any exercise program by paying attention to your, your pump on the insulin on board feature. So um, some athletes like to wear their pump while they're playing. Others take it off. So Jason Johnson was a pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles and Chicago White Sox. He wore his pump and he put it in a sports pack. So that works out for people. Um, I've talked with um, athletes that, for instance, pitchers, that they take it off when they're on the mound. But in the dugout, they put it back on, and then they check their blood sugar like every other inning. And, and it's a great strategy for them. Uh, so they are getting some insulin. Um, but the type of exercise from pitching, you know, there's a chance that, that could increase. So if you're keeping it off for four or five innings, and, you know, you're an hour, hour and a half into it, uh, there's a good chance between the, you know, just the stress of, of the competition and not having insulin in the body that you could end up with a very high blood sugar afterwards. So there are different techniques on whether you're wearing it or not. Um, another uh, idea, and this is a scale called the Borg scale, and that's a perceived exertion. Uh, this was uh, developed by a, a doctor, uh, William Borg, not around diabetes, but just in general. So it's your perceived exertion. And basically you say, either during the activity or right afterwards, give yourself a number of the intensity or how you feel the exercise, uh, you know, that during the exercise, how you felt. So if you said afterwards, it's like, geez, I just walked and I was able to talk with my friend or whatever, I'm going to give myself a seven. So it's a very light uh, exercise for that day. Well, let's just say that you're on the treadmill and you were doing intervals and you were really wiped out afterwards and you're 18. So the intensity is very high. And basically the reason they go six to 20 rather than one to 10, this was developed around the resting heart rate. So somebody that's in decent shape, that they're given minimal effort, you just put a zero behind that. So a seven would be your uh, 70 beats per minute. If you're up around 18, you put a zero there, it's about 180 beats per minute, which is very high. Um, what I've uh, uh, experimented with is my temporary basal based on my perceived exertion. So if I normally do a 50% reduction on my basal and then um, maybe do it for four or five hours afterwards, that could be like a 12. So it's a moderate type of exercise. Now, if one day that I, we played for two and a half hours and we won every game and, and uh, I'm giving myself a 17, that wipes me out. So I said, you know what? That may cause a low 
down the line. So I'm going to stick with my 50% reduction of my pump, but I'm going to extend it. Instead of doing four or five hours, I might do eight or nine hours. Um, and you can experiment with that. I've done as much as 15 hours, which was too much, but down to as much as 10 hours with a 50% reduction based on how I felt after the exercise. So it's a, it's a great uh, tool for you if you're interested in that. <clears throat> so the replacement of uh, muscle glycogen, very important. And if you can see that the, um, the muscle glycogen, that's the most important. Probably 70, 75% of what we're talking about is muscle glycogen. Uh, the liver, uh, some, and then the blood, some. So replacing this, very, very important. Um, and it, this is from Nancy Clark's uh, book on, on sports nutrition. It normally takes about 24 to 36 hours to replace the uh, muscle energy, the glycogen loss during exercise. Um, if you consume the carbohydrates and protein uh, within 15 minutes afterwards, your recovery time now will be in about the 12 to 16 hour range. So that's why when you do something on Saturday and replace collection stores immediately afterwards, you'll probably perform better on Sunday and your chances of a low blood sugar probably decrease as well. So it's very important. There are certain uh, snacks, examples, some of the nutrition shakes, the smoothies, a peanut butter sandwich is fine. I would go with whole wheat or multigrain rather than the white bread. Any kind of white flour certainly will spike up your blood sugar, but around exercise, rather see the whole grains uh, rather than the, um, you know, the, the white flour. Uh, mentioned about a, a great recovery drink is chocolate milk. A um, couple reasons why, the four grams of, of carbs to the one gram of protein, it's 90% water, so it's great for hydration. Um, and I think people like it more. Uh, the sports drinks, I think, can work to bring blood sugars up and down. But the, the, for nutrition, I don't know that it has the right combination. It certainly has the electrolytes. But uh, some of the uh, fructose in there, probably not great for you around exercise. So a great recovery drink is uh, chocolate milk. Um, the challenges, uh, as we mentioned earlier, that the this is an individualized disease. So what you do on Saturday, and then you do the exact thing on Sunday, but have a completely different number, that can happen. In fact, it's up to a 20% difference uh, in your blood sugar based on just the different day of of uh, what you're doing, so many factors involved. And then when you start comparing to other people that have diabetes, you can have up to a 35% difference in blood sugars if you say, oh, I'm gonna do what my friend over here does based on uh, the, you know their exercise or their technique and everything. So you have to be, understand that there's gonna be variation on this and, and uh, uh, be aware of it. So the um, continuous glucose monitoring is obviously uh, it's made great strides through the years. And I think it's um, at a level right now where the trending of it, if you're not on a CGM and you're, and, uh, and you're exercising, you're probably not, you know, at a place where you can uh, work out optimally because the trending um, and knowing sort of where your blood sugar is going before, you know, it actually happens. I think is very uh, it, um, it's it's great for people to to try new things, um, and as the technology improves, you're going to find it's going to help not only your diabetes but your performance. So what you see here is a um, uh, the thing that I did. Um, I was on a, a stairmaster for 40 minutes, and I went the highest intensity, and I started at 197. So you see the blue, which is the continuous glucose monitoring, and the red uh, dots are finger sticks. Um, and I started with a 197, which is a little bit higher. I like to be in a 150 to 175 range, but I was okay. About 20 minutes into it, I was 170. Still a good number, but I went from 197 to, uh, to 170. And then about 30 minutes into it, I was 117. And I'm still feeling good, but I'm dropping. Now I see that trend, so I ate 15 grams of carbs. Slowed down a little bit on the Stairmaster, had my uh, carbs, and then continue the exercise. And you see the white mark there, and it just lost the connection, but then picked back up. But at the 40-minute mark, I was 81. Still felt fine, got a great workout. But I thought to myself, if I did not eat 10 minutes ago, I probably would have been 50, and I would have to stop my exercise. And then what you see at night, so I then took, um, I had 15 grams of carbs, combination of carbs and protein. I did a 50% reduction in my basal rate um, for eight hours. And I woke up with 188. 
So the nut 188 is a little higher than I'd like. If I was 140, waking up after an exercise like that would have been dead on. So the trending on this is, is something that you look at. And I like at a point right now where um, if I'm playing basketball, and the, the sensor that I'm using actually has, I think it's 25 feet now, that you can, uh, it can pick up a signal. So I was playing uh, a couple weeks ago, and I'm running up down the court. All of a sudden, I heard my sensor go off. And someone goes, someone sent something's going off. They thought it was a phone. I said, no, it's mine. So I went over, and I checked my blood sugar. Sure enough, I think it was 65. I didn't necessarily feel it. I was involved in the, in the uh, game. And uh, so I took some juice, waited a few minutes, got back in, and, and people were, like, looking at me and saying, you know, that thing picks up while you're playing? I'm like, yes. So the technology on continuous glucose monitoring, I think, is phenomenal. Uh, some of the resources that uh, uh, you may use around exercise if you're not using a pump, using insulin, uh, as John Walsh uh, had this great chapter in there on exercise. Um, the Diabetic Athlete, Sherry Colbert, great book. I like because it gives guidelines. Uh, some of the things we talked about, the ADA has certain guidelines. She interviews people that exercise, athletes, different sports. She talks with people that are on pumps. She talks with people that were on injections. Um, and it just, it's a great book um, if you're involved with athletics. Gary uh, Shiner uh, wrote a book called Think Like a Pancreas. He's had uh, several versions of that. A lot of good information on there and exercise. If you're into the studies, the uh, Handbook of Exercise on Diabetes talks a lot about the studies involved uh, with exercise. And there are not a ton of them, but there are some good ones in there. And then the two uh, books you see on the bottom, one is called Pumping Insulin uh, by John Walsh, and the other is Smart Pumping by Howard Wolper. Both books, excellent. The Pumping Insulin probably gets into more detail. For the starting pumper, the Smart Pumping, it probably puts it more in, uh, in general terms, which I like. Uh, but great resources uh, that I think that anybody that's exercising can uh, certainly uh, find value in. And I want to thank you for your time and uh, hope to see you again.